my my personal beliefs in magic, I mean, there's a bunch of phenomena that I don't understand, but that I nonetheless don't necessarily think of as magic. Um, but in my in my books, magic is a kind of universal poetics, um, where the 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 universe responds to a certain kind of poetry, and that's why uh, you know using certain ingredients and using uh, certain gestures and whatever will have this resonance in the world that responds. I have three authors reading. Uh, they are Lyra Celine, Anna Stolkart, and E.C. Ambrose. Uh, we'll have time for a little chat, and then I'll open it up for questions. All right, let's get on our way. So my name is Elaine Isaac, and as E.C. Ambrose, I'm the author of the uh, Dark Apostle series, which is dark historical fantasy about medieval surgery. The fifth and final volume, which is over here, Elisha Damon, came out in February of last year, which means you can now binge read the entire series for those who are up for it. And uh, on, on the assumption that many of you have probably not read books one through four, I'm going to read a little bit from book one. Uh, and this is actually the scene that came to my mind when I was inspired to write the book. And content warning, because this is barbers of medieval history who, along with cutting hair, also did surgery. So yay. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, we can talk about that later. <laughs> uh, so this is from chapters two and three. Elisha is the protagonist. He is a barber surgeon in 14th century London. And his brother Nathaniel uh, has a wife who is going into labor. So Nathaniel has just dragged Elisha away from a client to come visit his pregnant wife in the hospital. Appalled that his own brother doesn't know how dangerous the hospital is, Elisha orders a cart and then goes to visit Helena, who is the wife. A hand thrust aside the curtain, admitting Sister Lucretia, followed by a plump woman with her sleeves bound back from her arms. Elisha, she grunted, the midwife. Elisha's heart sank yet further when he recognized her, matronly, barely competent, with a demeanor soothing to pregnant women. Her combination of piety and comfort would appeal to his brother, almost as much as the fact that Elisha disapproved of her. Following close, they returned to Helena's side. Now, dear, the midwife said, bending down to check the infant's position. Only Elisha caught the flash of horror on her face. When she looked up again, her voice was still as calm as ever, though her hands quavered. Now, dear, the physician recommends a cutting. We'll live the, lift the babe from your belly and stitch it back up again, right? Nodding desperately, Helena clung to her husband with both hands. We'll be needing water then, the midwife went on, and a better knife than what I brought. With a cold certainty, certainty, Elisha laid a hand on Helena's taut belly, pressing the still form of the child she carried. Too still. He grabbed the midwife's arm and pulled her aside, turning his face to, from his brother. You're going to cut her open, he whispered urgently. The physician advises. He knows who she is and her circumstances. I barber, he does, the midwife snapped, tugging at his grip. Elisha swore under his breath, so he thinks to save the babe at her expense. The midwife dropped her gaze, her thin mouth set. God willing, if I stitch her right up. Elisha didn't listen to the rest. Under the best of circumstances, cutting into the abdomen was risky, best left to master surgeons, and even then more likely to kill than to cure. He looked at Lucretia. You found a cart? The nun nodded once, and horses. The first good news he'd yet been offered. Elisha grinned, bless you. He lifted Nathaniel to his feet and pushed his barbering tools into his brother's hands. Then, with a nod to the imperious ward sister, he caught up Helena in both arms and drew her to his chest. There's not a moment to spare. But she said, Nathaniel began to protest. Then he whirled, seizing the midwife's hand. Please, come with us. Elisha met the midwife's eye, the fear in his brother's voice still ringing in his ears. Grudgingly, he said, she'll have need of you. She held up her hands in a gesture of despair. I, Barbara, I'm coming. Then we have a life to save, he said, turning away to escape the hospital, its reeking beds of corpses, both living and dead. The furious ward sister pursued them. Only the saints may intercede for her, she cried, tugging at Elisha's arm. By God's grace alone and through his physician shall be, she be saved. He snarled low in his throat, causing the nun to stumble and cross herself. He should have been there as soon as they thought she was pregnant, but his own arrogance had estranged them. He would welcome the saints if they would serve her and damn them all if they could not. Outside waited a new wagon with tall wheels drawn by a sturdy team of chestnut draft horses. 
A pair of apprentice Wainwrights idled with their charge, grinning at the sight of Lucretia. Elisha had no doubt how she'd come to earn their favors in years past. Nathaniel clambered into the wagon, kneeling to draw Helena's clenched form from Elisha's arms. With easy strength, Elisha scooped the midwife and deposited her alongside, then started when a Lucretia took up a handhold and pulled herself in as well. She met his gaze and murmured to pray for her at the least. She may need help from more than God, but his aid is worth the asking. Aye, sister. Elisha moved around to mount the wagon beside the carter. You'll have our gratitude to make it speedy, he told the man as the apprentices clambered up as well. Elisha pointed the way, taking them by quick turns from the main streets to byways where they could urge the team to greater speed. Behind him, he heard Helena's screams, Nathaniel's soothing tones, the steady rise and fall of women's voices in prayer. The screams came more quickly now, and by the time they reached the tinsmithy, she let out a continuous wail of agony. Springing down before they'd even stopped, Elisha ran to the squat house adjoining his brother's shop. Despite the hurt which lay between them, he and Nathaniel yet shared the house left them by their parents. The married Nathaniel had claimed the front rooms and, for the child they dreamed of, the loft, while Elisha, though older, had taken the low back rooms for his home and study. Now he left the others to bring Helena in while he gathered his tools. Hooks and shelves lined the study, even concealing the little unglazed windows, for which he now cursed the lack of light. Catching up a leather satchel, Elisha tossed in a few knives, as well as containers of herbs to soothe during childbirth. He knew the tool he needed, the only tool but he dreaded to carry it alone, as if doing so would be to admit failure. He rounded the ho house and mounted the stoop outside, taking a deep breath before entering the open door. They'd moved the two benches and the basin stand from the center of the room to stand in the yard, with Elisha's barbering tools heaped on top. Helena screamed, a dreadful sound that tore through him. Lucretia was right. It was God they needed here. Feet first, Nathaniel cried from within. I, sir, and not that I did would turn it the midwife replied. Then, almost timidly, there's still time to take the physician's word, but Elisha is just a barber for all that he's got good hands. Squaring his shoulders, Elisha ducked inside. And whose hands would carry out the esteemed physician's advice? Yours? I find it unlikely. He leveled a cold stare at her. Do what you can for the lady and let me attend the child. With a grunt, she turned away. Gently, Lucretia tucked an arm around Nathaniel's shoulders. Come away, sir. We're too many here. Let them do what they must. Perhaps your work would bring you some comfort now. When they'd gone outside, Elisha knelt at the table. Helena's gown lay askew, barely covering her distended belly, which heaved and shuddered as she sobbed. The midwife held both Helena's arms, murmuring without words. Between Helena's legs protruded the tiny foot, grayish and foreign. How long has the child been dead? He asked in a quiet voice. Don't know what you mean. The midwife returned, adjusting her grip, her kerchief's head lowered. He stared at her, a strange numbness suffusing his heart. Of course you do. You know your business, just as I know mine. This child was dead before she ever went to the hospital. Nothing for it but to have the baby, is there? She dodged his glare. Will you cut her then? That's what the physician... God damn the physician, Elisha shouted, and God damn you, he added through clenched teeth. Her head jerked up, her mouth working on words she could not speak. Spilling the leather satchel onto the floor, Elisha searched among the tools for the one he needed. A slender, long-handled knife, saw with fine, sharp teeth, meant for the amputation of fingers or toes. The tool had never been to put to such terrible use as what he must do. He gripped it tightly and nearly prayed himself. She cannot be intending, the midwife said, her lips trembling. Her body won't rest until the child is out, he told her quietly. It is already lost to me, but she is not. From the doorway, Lucretia said, Oh, sweet Lord, crossing herself. Her eyes suddenly open and wild. Helena shrieked and kicked. You'll not, you bastard, you'll not cut my baby. But the protest drowned in another cry, and blood stained the table beneath her. The nun crossed to her and caught her leg, shouting Bible verses to be heard above the din. Humming in his throat, letting the sound buzz up into his skull, Elisha gripped the instrument and began his awful work, laying the child to rest in the empty leather bag as blood flowed around his arms. His namesake saint had once healed the river with salt, but Elisha knew there would be no healing this flood. When it was done, he sat back on his heels, letting his humming die away. The delicate saw dropped from his tired hand. He applied a careful pressure to Helena's lower belly, watching intently to be sure the blood was stopping. He leaned back from her when he was satisfied. Up to the elbow, blood slicked his arms. It stained his shirt and his breeches where he knelt on the floor. In his urgency, he hadn't thought to take his apron. For a long time, he stared down at his hands. 
Now they shook with the horror of the deed. Unsteadily, he pulled to the flap on the leather satchel and thrust it under the table as far from himself as he could. Only then did he notice the quiet and raise his head. Helena's legs lay at last relaxed, her belly still large but flaccid now, draped with her ruined gown. At her side, Sister Lucretia stood, pale, lips still murmuring prayers, but the words misplaced, the cadence trailing off, then recalling itself. The midwife laid Helena's arms across her chest and met Elisha's help helpless gaze. So now you've done. Happy are you to have cost your brother his wife? No, he breathed, his hands dangling. Elisha got to his feet and searched Helena's still, pale lips. No, he repeated, she can't be. Unwilling to touch her with her child's blood still on his hands, Elisha stared hard at her throat and saw no sign of pulse or breathing. He stood stunned, his hands aching from the close, careful work, his skin recalling the intimacy of the mother's flesh. Did you cut something else down there? Did you ruin it all on purpose or with ignorance? The midwife thrust herself close to him, putting yourself in woman's business, evading the physician's order, casting curses all about you. You've no place here, barber. Your brother must be told. She jammed her fists onto her hips and bustled out the door. Dazed, Elisha moved to the head of the table near Lucretia. What happened? He asked. What's gone wrong? He wiped his hands upon his thighs, leaving long red streaks. Go to your brother, Lucretia said. Don't let it be her word, he hears. But she's right. Leaning upon the table, Elisha felt the strain in his arms and knees. How long had he knelt there, trying to be careful, to be sure he did no harm to the mother? If he'd only gotten me sooner, he murmured, maybe then, or if we'd stayed at the hospital. There was noise behind him, but he could not be distracted. The hospital's unclean and full to the roof of illness, Elisha, the nun told him. I know you that as well as you. It was charity that brought me there, not hope. If the child was already dead, what could the physician's order do but wound the mother yet again? What did it matter if he had done the right thing now that it had all gone terribly wrong? Shaking his head, Elisha straightened. What penance for the work of this day, sister? Tell me that, if you know. Ask it of the Lord, Elisha, she said. And remember that he is also merciful. Go to your brother. He'll be needing you, though he doubts it now. Aye, as would any man of sense. Edging back around the table, he kicked his scattered tools. Elisha did not care. After this, heaven forbid he ever take up his instruments to cut more than hair. Cover her, sister? I will. He tripped on the steps and shook himself, blinking in the sunlight. How dare the sun look bright on him today? His fingers flexed and released. He had lost patients before, strangers, neighbors. It always hurt, even when he knew they could have had no better care. But this, he could not imagine a loss so great, a failure so awful. Two years he hoped to reconcile with his brother, his only living kin. He would be lucky now if Nathaniel even came to his funeral. To one side, the Wainwright's men stood watching, their faces slack with horror and wonder at a tragedy which touched them not. Elisha wondered why they'd not yet gone to spread the news. Nathaniel? He swept his gaze about the yard, settling in a moment on the apprentices who shifted uneasily. The workshop, I think, one of them said. Lucy, our sister Lucretia, took him there. We just come back to see what help she needs. Nodding, Elisha turned away. Knocking on the door, he heard no answer and pushed it open with a soiled hand. The shaft of sunlight he let in traced its path upon the dirt floor, lighting up the workbench, striking a brass gleam off a familiar object, so out of place he could not at first name it. His basin, that was it. Wide metal basin, the brim full of darkness, with his brother's blonde head sunk in grief beside it. Nathaniel, Elisha said, coming forward from the light. Perched on his tall stool, Nathaniel bent over the table, his arm outstretched, Elisha's razor close to hand. No, 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 no. Elisha chanted to himself, his eyes sweeping the trail of blood, the open blade, the angle of his brother's arm. All the breath left him, all of his own blood, like his brother's, like his nephew's, seeping away, until he stood as a marble figure in the shaft of sunlight, struck through and dying. Thank you. Hi, I'm N.S. Um, my The third book of my trilogy, A Breach in the Heavens, <coughs> Uh, came out in October, um, and uh, I'm actually going to read to you from book three, um, but I'm going to read to you the reintroduction of a character who um, ran away from home at the end of book two, um, and seeing as this is 11 years later, she's being reintroduced, so it's okay if you don't <laughs> know anything about her. Um, Except that she's like a dragon person. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> a little detail. Comes up later. 
Sooner or later, everything washed up in Atuna. Dessa certainly hadn't meant, meant to end up here when she'd run away from home so many years ago. She had meant to find Vela and Bandu wherever they had gone off to, and learn how to do magic the way Bandu did it. But she had never found them, and could still barely do more with her magic than when she was a child. Instead, she had spent a decade lost among beggars and thieves, always a meal or two from starvation and one piece of bad luck away from violence. She had come to Atuna with a friend. It was always safer to do anything with a friend. But the friend had gotten himself killed breaking into a storehouse, so now she was back to the dangerous work of finding a new friend. She had been too trusting in the past and had scars to prove it. Choosing poorly was worse than having no friend at all. If only she had found Bandu and learnt magic from her, Dessa's life would have been different. With the power to raise people from the dead, to make houses weep, and force people to take her seriously, she would not have had all these troubles with dangerous men. She still lived with the hope that she might someday find Bandu, though deep down she knew it was a false hope. Dessa was no less determined at 22 than she'd been at 11, but she knew now that determination wasn't everything. You needed luck, too, and Dessa had precious little of it. She should never have run away from home. Bandu and Vela couldn't have gone far if she'd only stayed and waited for news instead of wandering off on her own. She might have found them years ago. She often wished she could go back and shake some sense into herself. How far could two teenagers and a baby really have gone? But once she had left home, once she had gotten herself involved with the sorts of people she had met along the way, it was impossible to go back. What could she say to her mother? To face the pain on mother's face when she saw what a mess Dessa had made of her life. No, she just couldn't. Anything would be better than that. Dessa had left mother with so little. A dead, disgraced husband, an angry, confused, slowly dying mother, a missing daughter. The decision to leave home at 11 hadn't just been ill-advised, it had been unspeakably selfish. That was why she could never go home. As hard as the last 10 plus years had been, they'd been easier for Dessa than facing all the pain she'd caused mother. Better to stay away, to be the mysterious lost daughter forever. She'd had dreams once of returning home with her father in tow, having rescued him from death just as Bandu had rescued Crichton. She understood now how ridiculous a dream it had been. Father wasn't a hero like Crichton, he was a murderer. Nobody wanted him back but Dessa. But even if she couldn't have that dream, she could still aspire to Bandu's magic. Nobody cared what kind of life a witch had, or what mistakes she'd made in her youth. People like Bandu were mysterious, distant figures that people admired and feared. Nobody came close enough to see their flaws. Dessa was sitting in a corner in the main room of a sailor's hostel, thinking about Bandu and her invisible flaws, when a man came over and offered her some honey wine. That was one good thing about Atuna. The best wines came through its port. Sailors were not the sort of people who saved up for things. They would arrive in some harbor with more money than expenses and no more responsibility than they had since, and a few good drinks and trinkets later they were off to sea again. This particular sailor was toting two undersized bottles made of yellow glass, which must have been extremely expensive and come from far beyond the sea. Dessa knew the beers and wines of the continent all too well, and nobody out here put their wine in glass bottles. The bottle would have been ten times as expensive as its contents. What's the occasion? she asked, handing him her cup. Been away for three years and come back to find my wife hasn't been pregnant since I left. This other <laughs> bottle's just for her. Dessa smiled despite herself. You didn't have that good news when you bought it, though. No, but there's always special occasions. Here, drink it. You've never tasted anything like it. He was right. She had expected something sweet and cloying, but instead her tongue met with an incredible subtlety of flavor that made her wish she'd taken a smaller sip. This wine was too good to drink quickly. Where did you get this? Antaka. It's an island halfway to the other continent. This is an Assetian wine. His names meant nothing to her, but she tried to look impressed. It's amazing. Drink of kings, he said. I'm going to treat her like a queen. She usually likes them sweeter, but you can't beat a Cetian honey wine. Well, if she doesn't like it, you know where to find me. What ship did you come in on? The Sunbeam, good Atunian ship. Same one that brought that witch here. 
Dessa had to put her cup down so it wouldn't spill while she coughed out the wine she'd inhaled. What witch? Called herself Phaedra. You hadn't heard? She made a big scene when she got here about going to meet the High Council. It wasn't Bandu then, but the name Phaedra did have a familiar ring to it. Besides, a witch was a witch. Dessa wasn't picky who she learned from, just so long as she got to learn. What does she look like? How do I find her? The sailor looked a bit surprised at her urgency, but he didn't say anything rude about it. I don't know. She can't be at the council building anymore. That was hours ago. You don't know what she looks like either? Oh, I know what she looks like. About this tall, real dark skin, almost black. An islander, or maybe even a Cetian herself, though the name isn't Eastern. Real beauty, though. If she wasn't a witch, they'd have all been cramming into her cabin. Talks like a councilman with big, long words. She's hard to miss, really. Thanks, Dessa said, rising to her feet and almost forgetting her honey wine. She made a quick decision and drained her cup, not swallowing until she absolutely had to. She, he hadn't given her too much, but she still felt like she'd wasted it. She raced to the door and away from the hostel, ignoring the stairs. She didn't even know where the council building was, but she imagined it was further from the docks than this. She'd ask on her way. She knew where she'd heard the name Phaedra now. The description had been all she needed. Phaedra was dark-skinned like Bandu or Crichton because she was their kinswoman, a Tarfeian Islander. Dessa had seen her just the once, the day they had stoned father. She had no idea Phaedra was a witch, but she had been there when it happened, and afterwards she was gone. Dessa couldn't let her disappear this time. She raced through the city, her head pounding, stopping often to ask how to get to the council building, but only able to follow the directions of people's pointing fingers. She was drunker than she'd realized when sitting there in the hostel. It was very noticeable to judge from people's reactions, but she didn't mind the embarrassment. She minded that it was making it harder to find the council building on the one day in her life when she really needed to be somewhere in a hurry. By the time she got there, the witch had gone. Dessa was nearly sober now, but it didn't help much because everyone she asked about Phaedra acted as if they themselves were drunk. Nobody seemed to know where she had gone or even how long ago. Dessa's questioning only got her half answers and vacant stares, which were so much worse than the judgmental stares she'd grown used to. Had anyone tried to follow Phaedra when she left? Oh yes, definitely. Some of those Dessa asked had tried it themselves. But not one knew where she'd gone in the end, and every one of them pointed Dessa in a different direction. It was maddening. Dessa couldn't believe that it was a coincidence. She had asked six different people in the vicinity of the council building, and none of them agreed with each other. It, ha it had to be a confounding spell. For whatever reason, Phaedra didn't want to be found. Well, that was unacceptable. Dessa didn't care what Phaedra wanted. It didn't matter whether she was covering her tracks to avoid an enemy, whoops, or intentionally persecuting Dessa for some reason, which was certainly what it felt like. The important thing was that Dessa would not let her slip away, not when they were in the same godforsaken city. One way or another, she'd find her and make her reveal her secrets. One way or another, if only she knew how. That was the trouble with Dessa's life. She was all determination and no plan. She had always believed in herself, believed that if she just threw herself at a problem without reservation, it would yield to her. So far, it hadn't really worked out that way. Too often, she had confused her faith in herself for the protection of her God, and too often, she had been disappointed. God Most High had yet to intervene on her behalf, no matter how scary things got. She'd spent years on the road searching for Bandu, and all she had to show for it was a decade's worth of bad experiences, a handful of Atunian coins, and a taste for wine. Everything would get better after she found Phaedra. It had to. There was nothing that magic couldn't fix once she knew the trick of it. Bandu had proven that much. For an hour, Dessa wandered around the city, asking after Phaedra and going in whatever direction people suggested. It wasn't a logical plan. The city was too large and the trail too cold. But it didn't get in the way of devising a better plan. It just gave her feet and mouth something to do that didn't feel as useless as pacing and mumbling to herself. Next, she tried the marketplace in the Temple Square. They were likely enough places to find someone who'd recently disembarked from a long voyage. But if Phaedra had stopped there, she wasn't there anymore. For the next few hours, Dessa checked every inn and hostel in the city, from the fanciest ambassador-worthy places to the least reputable sailors' hostels. At the former, she was lucky to get a polite no before some private guard escorted her to the door. At the latter, she only got the usual propositions. 
She feared, but rejected, the possibility that Phaedra had already left the city. If she had stopped to speak with the Atunian High Council upon her arrival, she couldn't possibly have moved on already. Yet here it was growing dark, and nobody knew where she had gone. The woman had completely disappeared. Dessa cursed that sailor for not having told her about Phaedra sooner. Maybe if she had left a few minutes earlier, the trail would have been warmer and the search wouldn't be so fruitless. She doubted it, but it did help to be angry at someone, and the sailor was a convenient target. She hoped his wife spat out her wine. <laughs> she hated the way people stared at her while she roamed around the twilight city, as if looking unkempt and frustrated made her less human. She had half a mind to bring out her claws and give them something to really stare at, but there was no sense endangering herself over a few nasty looks. A dirty madwoman was distasteful. A dirty madwoman with claws was a public menace. She couldn't let the stairs go unanswered, though, so instead of going back to the hostel, she spent some of her savings from the storehouse robbery, the one she'd lost her big friend to, and stayed at one of the nicer inns she could afford. The food was better, and they had baths. It was the best night's sleep she'd had in ages. She dreamt that her mother was welcoming her home with tears and kisses, and that father was thanking her profusely for what she had done. Villa was there, too, saying how proud she was and calling Dessa her sister. She awoke with a smile on her face, enjoying the sunshine from her window, hanging on to the last remnants of her dream before she had to go back to her woman hunt. It wouldn't hurt to spend a few extra moments in bed. After all, rushing hadn't helped her yesterday. She'd probably do better if she spent some less time running and more time thinking. Plus, she'd miraculously escaped a hangover, so the sleep was definitely worth it. Her clothes were still a bit damp when she put them on. She'd washed them in the bath the night before, after she finished bathing. The wet cloth was rough against her skin, but it would dry in the sun, and at least her clothes were clean. She couldn't remember the last time she'd washed them. If she did find Phaedra today, she wanted to make a good impression. She ate a satisfying meal that was more lunch than breakfast, parting with some of her last Atunian coins. When she finally left the inn, it was well past noon. Her plan was to go back to the council building and see if Phaedra had returned, but that proved unnecessary. It was hard to miss the sheer bulk of armament being carried toward the docks, and when Dessa asked for an explanation, she was told that the Tarfeian witch was leading a fleet to rid her homeland of pirates. Dessa raced for the docks, hoping to find some excuse for boarding the same ship as Phaedra. She didn't have any skills that would be useful on a ship. She had never sailed, never fought in a battle, couldn't even cook well. Could she just lie about that? She didn't think so. They'd know she was no sailor within seconds. She reached the docks, still with no plan, so she began by asking which ship Phaedra was on. Atun's favor was the biggest warship in the Atunian navy, too large to be anchored at the quay except when loading or unloading. Naturally, it was fully manned already, waiting out in the harbor for the rest of the fleet. Dessa could have almost screamed. It felt like God Most High was throwing obstacles in her way on purpose. Why was he doing this to her? Some of the smaller ships were still loading up for the expedition. She could try her luck with those. Dessa ran over to the place where a few armed citizens were boarding a dinghy. They wore no armor, so they must have been volunteers. Please, she begged the man who was directing them onto the boat, take me too. The man shook his head. He was tall and handsome with a gold ring in, his, in the left side of his nose. Boat's full, but I'll be back. The glimmering sea is not a ferry, though. If you can't fight or sail, we don't need you. I can fight, Dessa lied. Determination or no, everyone else had a weapon, and she didn't. No, you can't. Get out of here. <laughs> they shoved off, and Dessa watched them row to the ship. Time to try a different boat. But at each one, the reaction was the same. They were not taking unarmed women with no sailing experience. The fleet would leave without her. She could wait until they returned, but knowing her luck, Phaedra would have come ashore, would come to shore in the middle of the night and be off before Dessa could even learn of her arrival. On the other hand, that dinghy was coming back for one more trip. Anything that got her onto it would be well worth the risk. You again, the man on the dinghy said when he looked up from his rowing and saw her waiting. I thought I told you, we've got no room for useless passengers. Dessa could feel the stares of the people around her. I'm not useless, she said. I could be very helpful. Oh yeah, how? She took a deep breath. I'm dragon touched. Slowly, she let herself transform. Her hands and feet turned into claws, losing their extra digits. She had spent so long in hiding, she'd almost forgotten how much more comfortable it was this way, when she wasn't stretching her hands to make that last little finger, or forcing her scales down below the skin. 
She'd always preferred it this way, but had learned the risks of being openly dragon-touched outside her people's territory. She hoped this time she'd get a more favorable reaction. The sailor only recoiled slightly, which was better than it might have been. The others waiting to get on his boat backed away to give her more room, their fear and distaste palpable. What good is that? The sailor asked. We don't need you gouging our planks. I won't gouge your planks, Dessa said, trying to keep the desperation from her voice. You said I'd be no good against the pirates, but I can surprise them. I can breathe fire too when I need to. That's dangerous on a ship. I don't want you. I can control it, she snapped. I haven't breathed fire on you yet, have I? But I could do it at the pirates' ships. Well, he didn't look dismissive, so that was something. He didn't look enthusiastic either, though. I can ask the captain. If you take her, I'm staying here. Dessa turned to glare at the man who had spoken. He wasn't anything impressive to look at, and the weapon he carried was just a board with some nails in it. <laughs> she could hardly wait for the sailor to ask who cares. But he didn't. Instead, he just turned back to her and said, Sorry, it's an interesting idea and all, but we can't have people saying they want to go back to shore because of you. It's not worth the trouble. Dessa stood, her mouth agape, not knowing what to say. The other people boarded the dinghy, and all she could do was to choke out, wait, please wait, as they rowed it away. A few minutes later, the ships began to leave the harbor. What remained were only the usual fishing boats and merchantmen, going about their business as if nothing had happened, as if nobody's dreams had been dashed after getting so tantalizingly close to fulfillment. Dessa sat on the dock and cried. <laughs> Hi everybody, um, my name is Lyra Celine, um, and my debut novel Amber and Dusk was released uh, November 27th of last year. Um, this is a world divided by dusk. On one side lies the Midnight Dominion, um, a land permanently wreathed in dark shadows. Um, and on the other is the Amber Empire, um, a land scorched by an unmoving sun. Uh, raised in the dusk lands between light and dark, um, a young woman named Sylvie believes that she is destined for something special by merit of um, her magical power, which is to create illusions. Um, undertaking a journey to travel to the capital city, um, she presents herself at court to try and join um, what's known as Curdor, which is the, uh, the Amber Empress's uh, court. <coughs> Entering the amber atrium was like waking into a dream of paradise. The spacious room was airy and full of colors. Potent sunlight streamed in through a curving ceiling paned with colored glass, tossing jewels across the creamy floor. Flowers spilled across walls and along fluted pillars, filling my nostrils with a dense perfume. Arrayed along a series of shallow tiers rising toward the throne was the amber court strutting and preening like exotic birds. Even the flowers seemed drab and plain besides those courtiers. Everyone was young and lovely. Silk nestled against velvet and satin whispered secrets to great sweeping feathers pinned to headdresses or draped along sleeves. Courtiers lounged along divans and among scattered pillows, lithe and elegant, jeweled fingers waving and fans twisting. Soft chatter rustled the air. A young woman gowned in tangerine strummed at a lyre, while another girl with blue-tinged skin sang. The sound sent a frisson of delight tripping down my spine. A young lord with hair like glass tossed a glittering crystal decanter toward the ceiling, where it exploded in a, in a cloud of glittering fragments. Prisms danced across the floor. When the shards hit the floor, the decanter was whole once more. I stared at a billow of opalescent orbs, a tangle of vines, sprouting roses that bloomed in seconds. And perched above it all, like an orchid among weeds, sat Severine, the Amber Empress herself. She was beautiful. Her neck was long and elegant, the imperious tilt of her chin softened by the gentle smile on her ruby lips. Dark auburn hair made complicated coils around her head. The pale fabric of her dress caught a spill of colored light, and for a moment I could almost believe her gown itself was wrought from stained glass. Stay here, Dowser grunted. Don't say or do anything unless I tell you to. I jumped. I had nearly forgotten why I was here. 
Nervousness sent threads of fire stitching down my arms to itch against my palms. I squeezed them into fists. Not yet. Dowser cut through the jardin of indolent courtiers, severe as a raven among songbirds. He bowed to the empress and stepped forward to whisper in her ear. She leaned toward him, and for a long moment they were still as a tableau. I thought suddenly of a moldy tapestry in the Temple of the Scion, an illustration of the story of Meridian and the be beginning of the longest day. Dark and light side by side, night reaching ever for the day, separated only by dusk. The Empress glanced at me. Even from across the room, those violent, eye violet eyes fastened on me with all the power and capability of the empire they presided over. I gasped, sucking in a sip of perfumed air. I was pinned to the spot, caught in the space between those eyes. Finally, she looked away. I took a shuddering step back, my heart racing in my chest. The Empress said one last thing to Dowser, then rose to her feet with a sighing sweep of her luxurious gown. Come closer, child, she called out, her voice sonorous as the nocturne bell. Nobles raised drowsy heads crowned in curls and braids and feathers. Jewels waked from hats and robes and hems and fingers. Red lips twisted into smiles and grimaces. A giggle sprinted around the room like a naughty child. Embarrassment heated my blood, followed by an icy rage. I took one step, and the sound of my ragged boot on the priceless marble, marble was like thunder in my ears. Another step. I climbed toward the throne. The court scattered before me, flower petals blown before a high wind. Fluttering fans hid smirks and winks. I gritted my teeth so hard I thought my jaw would crack. These are your people, I reminded myself. This is your world. But I wasn't as sure as I'd been yesterday. I paused a few tears below the Empress and dropped into what I hoped was a passable curtsy. Another delicate laugh scampered to and fro. My fury grew cold and hard and smooth, a river stone polished by tides of wear. The Empress smiled down. So, she waved at the iridescent fan in a lazy circle. Her eyes touched mine, but this time there was none of the forbidding power of an empress, only gentle humor. My dowser tells me you have an interesting secret to share with my court. Yes, majesty, I forced out, my voice barely above a whisper. Why don't you tell us all? Her fan made a sweeping motion to include the assembled courtiers. We love a good secret, don't we? Someone shouted, a mocking, hear, hear. More laughter. Nausea bloomed in my gut, hot and sour. She traveled far, Majesty, supplied Dowser, sensing my discomfort. They all sense your discomfort, said a nasty voice within me. Pray, tell us why, cooed the Empress. I'm a legacy, I managed. I've come to join your court. Stunned silence. Slippered feet shuffled on luxuriant carpets. Whispers coiled behind raised fans. I dared a glance over my shoulder and saw nothing but eyes staring like livid jewels from a sea of blank porcelain masks. The Empress didn't flinch. Delightful. She dropped me a slow wink. Perhaps you'll favor us with a demonstration. I've been longing for a distraction from all these dull legacies you see before you. A feminine titter scraped sharp nails down the back of my neck and struck sparks on my growing anger. They were making fun of me. The courtiers, the empress, did Dowser bring me here to be humiliated? I sliced my gaze toward the black-robed chevalier, but his expression was shuttered behind the lenses of his spectacles. Those poisonous courtiers will never accept someone like you. Luca's bitter words echoed in my ears muffled only by the sick pounding of my own heartbeat. What if I'd been wrong about where I was meant to belong? No. I survived tides of indifferent sisters locking me in my room, just so they didn't have to look at me. When the ragtag Dusklander bullies called me monster and poked me with sharpened sticks, I snarled back. I escaped the creeping claws of dominion, traveling spans with no money and little food. All for this. This world of enchantment and beauty and bright-eyed accomplishment. And it was exquisite. Astonishing not because it existed, but because I hadn't even been able to imagine it without seeing it for myself. 
I would just have to prove that I belonged here, that I deserved a place in this sunlit sanctuary filled with jewels and daydreams and perfect faces. I let my eyes flutter shut. A distant hum drowned out my panicked thoughts. Images crowded against the back of my eyelids, colors, pictures, emotions. I discarded each in turn, too small, too ugly, too obvious, until I was left with only one. I remembered fire and lithe limbs sliding through complicated choreography, charred meat, hard eyes, a plucked lute, a flash of cambric chain and ambric dust, and a story. A story of a wicked sun and an innocent moon and the god king who changed the world forever. My palms tingled, but I clenched them together, willing the tingle to spread up my arms, to creep toward my shoulders, to tease the nape of my neck. I spread my arms and thought of the midnight dominion, that ominous shadow staining the horizon of my childhood home. I imagined it bigger, purer, consuming. I poured every ounce of anger and fear and confusion into that darkness. I became it. Night poured out of my hands, thick and velvet, impenetrable. I strewed pebbles of silver in the blackness, pricking it with bright points of light. A high whine filled my ears, drowning out a chorus of gasps. The illusion was barely bigger than the space between my arms, but it was greater than anything I'd ever, ever attempted. Already I could fear it, feel it wearing on me. My arms trembled, my breath gasped. The ringing in my ears trebled, becoming something like a scream. Not yet. I had never seen the moon. No living soul had. So I made it like Noemi had described it, huge and glowing. Silver light streamed through the blackness, pale as marble and sharp as dristic. It sliced through the edges of the darkness and splintered against sunlight, scattering shards of mirror glass and amber across the atrium. I held the illusion for one blistering, aching, tortuous moment, and then I collapsed. A couple questions before we open it up to the audience. Um, and I was trying to think of uh, questions that united all of your uh, worlds together, uh, and there were only so many of them. <laughs> uh, even though you're all writing uh, fantasy, even uh, Elaine or E.C. Ambrose, however you prefer to go, um, uh, your, the magic in your book uh, shows up a little later than that. Uh, even though you're all writing fantasy, you're all coming at it from such different viewpoints. So in building the world where your story takes place, uh, were you thinking of specific historical events or cultures and who wants to start? I, I was for for um, the the setting for my trilogy um, comes from the way I view the Torah, um, which is an interesting thing to say considering that it's chock full of uh, lesser gods smiting people, um, <laughs> and it, like there's no even hint of monotheism until most of the way through book one. Um, but the, the, um, the feel that I get when reading the Torah is of a world that is just terrifying, um, <laughs> where you, like, God might just kill somebody and you don't know why, like, just somebody's dead, and then you're like, okay, well, he got burned, um, <laughs> maybe we can guess at why God did this, and try not to do it again. <laughs> um, and so, um, so that that was the kind of world I wrote, where where the gods might might kill you or chase you or terrify you for mysterious reasons, and you might never find out why. Um, and so, humanity in in my series is just trying to appease multiple gods. Um, without really any knowledge of what will work. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's kind of the thought I had uh, for my series. Absolutely. Um, see, Lyra, do you want to? Yeah, sure. Sure. <coughs> so you created Cor de Or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, when I was first, uh, you know, when I first decided to make this kind of um, a court fantasy with court intrigue um, and politics, um, 
I, I knew that I wanted to um, have there be a familiarity with history um, and to reach back into some um, actual historical courts to have that, that sense of authenticity. Um, and I was reading at the time about um, the court of the Sun King, Louis XIV, um, Versailles. Um, and one thing that really fascinated me was um, the emphasis on like modes of decorum. Um, you know, there are these really rigid rules of polite society where you know every hour of the day was rigidly structured um, as a way for Louis XIV to control his nobility, um, to control his aristocracy by you know, getting them deeper and deeper into debt by buying more and more lavish gowns or clothing um, so that they were following him around every hour of the day trying to curry favor with him. Um, and it really um, just fascinated me the way that um, a, a monarch could use um, society or, you know, politeness or modes of decorum as a way of controlling their aristocracy. So that was um, one of my big inspirations for the court. So obviously I'm writing historical fantasy, uh, and it developed from research that I was doing for a separate novel that I was working on where I wanted to know a little bit more about medieval surgery for one scene in which a character was injured. So I started reading a few books, and then a few more books, and then I had a shelf of books, <laughs> and I thought this is a little excessive for the one scene where I need to know more. And then I had the, the vision of the character, which was Elijah standing uh, in the sunlight and blood is dripping off his hands and he's saying, my God, I killed them all. And I thought, well, who did he kill and why? And what's gonna happen next? Uh, everything that happened in the book, everything that I developed my concept for, including the magic, is based on beliefs from the 14th century period that the book is set in. So when the magic is introduced, it incorporates a lot of medieval notions of what magic was and how it might work, the different sort of crazy cures that they have. Later on, Elisha rides uh, to war with a carter who tells him, oh yeah, you know, I, I was terribly sick and I was cursed by a witch, so I needed to remove the curse and I had to bathe in mother's milk. And <laughs> Elisha, of course, thinks this is insane. And his remark is, that sounds expensive. <laughs> So, which you know, it probably would have been because somebody made a lot of money off of telling this man that that's what he needed to do. Do each of you outline when you write, um, or no outline at all? And yeah, Lane, do you want to start? <laughs> well, because this is actually the series that turned me into an outliner. Uh, in fiction circles, we often talk about plotters versus pantsers. So, pantsers are people who fly by the seat of their pants. And I wrote three other books that way first, which uh, came out under a different name. So when I came up with the idea for Elisha Barber, which is book one, I sort of immediately sprang into it. I pantsed five books. I was all excited. Oh, I have five books. It's a whole new series. And then when I sold book one, the editor was all excited about it, loved it very much, and said, but we don't feel like the rest of the series actually lives up to the potential that we see in book one. And I went, oh, so I have not written five books and sold them. I have written one book. Uh, and now they want me to develop a new series concept. And that's when I ended up going through a lot of brainstorming, uh, backtracking, developing new ideas, more research, noodling around, coming up with two different versions of a series arc for the whole thing before I found the one that worked beautifully. And I thought, oh, see, if I had done all of this to begin with, I would be so much better off. So yes, now I am a dedicated outliner. I uh, use a lot of spreadsheets to manage both my research and my concepts. I have a lot of different approaches that I use to develop that outline. But when I open a new Scrivener file, I already have a stack of note cards that are gonna cue me to what happens. And things do change. There's always changes, but definitely. Yeah, so um, I refer to myself as a combination plotter and pantser. Um, so I do outline, but um, very, very loosely. I create what I think of as a scaffolding for the story. Um, so a very broad outline of the major plot points, um, the character arcs, um, you know, all of this. But I leave a lot of the, you know, the scene to scene stuff uh, totally blank. Um, because I find that over the course of writing a book for the first time, I'm telling myself the story. And there's a lot of stuff that I discover along the way. Um, that I feel like if I'm too restricted to, or, to my outline, um, that I'm not open to exploring. So it's my process. 
Um, I'm very much a pantser. Um, <laughs> I've, I've been sort of making gentle forays into outlining as time goes by, but um, Come to the dark side. When, I, <laughs> when, I, when I wrote um, book one, which was called Silent Hall, uh, I had only the vaguest notion of what would happen in book two, and I sold a two-book deal, so then I <laughs> got to figure out what would be in book two. Um, and even when I finished book two, I didn't know how many books were left or what would happen in the next one. And then I found out that I would get to have a trilogy. So I was like, okay, I will plan one more book, and that will make it a little easier to figure out what I'm doing. Um, but it didn't. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was when, when I got uh, near the end of, of book three, and I was like, wow, I am tying up all these loose ends that I started in book one, and like they all still make sense. I was like, I felt like I was a, a not juggler, like someone who doesn't know how to juggle, who just chucked a bunch of stuff in the air, and then magically caught it all, and I was like, yes! <laughs> but but um, I hadn't really outlined it at all. I didn't know what was going to happen in the next chapter, let alone the next, um, the next book. Um, but what's interesting is that when I was near the end of each book, um, I was able to plot out what the last chapters were going to be. So um, for book one, I think I did that like seven chapters from the end. I was like, how close am I to the end of this book? And then I like figured it out and I was like, oh, okay, cool. I'm not that far away. Then the next book, it was like 10 chapters and the next book it was like 14 chapters. I was like, I was like I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting closer to the end and now I can figure out what happens in each chapter as it goes. Um, but I also used to get stuck on, on chapters a lot and I'd be like, uh, what is the next paragraph I want to write? What's actually happening in this chapter? <laughs> Um, and I've, I've gotten a little better at that by maybe doing the tiniest little chapter outlines. Like, I'll, I'll get stuck on a chapter now in my work in progress, and I'll, um, I'll just write a little paragraph saying, like, okay, here's what's going on in this chapter. Like, here's the feeling I want it to have, and maybe this could happen, or maybe that could happen, and I'll delete it, and I'll write the thing. Oh. So, I'm getting closer. <laughs> You're almost there. Yeah. Um, does anyone in the audience uh, have a burning question that they want to throw our panelists' way? Uh, when you're writing a story that takes place in a historical period or a fantastical world that is inspired by a historical period, how do you strike a balance between uh, creating characters who belong in that period and uh, writing for a modern audience? The question is, for those who didn't hear it, is how do you strike a balance between uh, writing in a historical period and making it, uh, making it palatable for a modern audience to sort of get into there? So, yeah? Uh, yeah, specifically with characterization. Specifically with characterization. Um, I like Elaine should start. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say, shelf full of books about surgery. Yes. So I always want my work to be accessible to the reader, even if what I'm working on is something that people have no experience with directly. People imagine the Middle Ages. In my book, I wanted to make sure that it felt real, that you know, part of my tagline is pseudo isn't medieval enough. So I, I got medieval on you. And, and yeah, definitely a lot of that was, come, was bringing out the perspective of Elisha as a character so that he can be a person who is familiar with all of those things that are unfamiliar to my readers, uh, and yet provide enough background for the things that he sees and does to make that part of the setting accessible to the reader. The other part, of course, is looking at the actual sort of attitudes and perspectives of characters in the Middle Ages. And Elisha's, uh, his perspective on things is that inside we're all the same because he is literally seen inside, <laughs> right? So one of his mentors he discovers sort of belatedly is Jewish. And uh, anti-Semitism, of course, was huge in the Middle Ages. His friend is, in fact, the only Jew in England at the time because they were expelled in 1291. So when he finds that out, some people are 
shocked and appalled. Like, what, what is this, you know, this person doing here? Barely a person doing here. Uh, and Elisha's attitude is is underneath. We're all the same. He's he's a valuable individual. He has valuable skills, and he's a little concerned because he's never actually inter interacted with a Jewish person before. Like what? And of course, there are all these horrible stories about oh, you know, the, the books are satanic, and you know, you they read them backwards. Uh, just, you know, just, just wrong. It's just wrong. Uh, so definitely looking for that balance between presenting Elisha as a person who could really be in the Middle Ages, and also uh, letting the reader know both what would be typical, and hopefully sort of easing them in through that by expounding on those typical attitudes and maybe showing some different perspectives even during that period. That was probably too much. No, that was fine. Um, because my world is almost primarily made up, uh, it's really easy for me to kind of pick and choose what I do and don't want to keep from the cultures or historical periods that I'm um, inspired by. So particularly in this book, um, even though I did take some inspiration from you know the courts of Europe in the 17th century. There were other elements that I really wasn't interested in having in my book, such as widespread misogyny um, and having you know women um, or people of color be you know considered a lower class and not be able to have um, power. So I chose in the society of my book um, to have those people. I mean, there are different prejudices and there are you know explorations of you know, race and sexuality and, um, you know, gender. But I think overall, I didn't necessarily want to reflect that from our world or our history. Um, so I was able to kind of effectively pick and choose what I did and did not um, want to reflect in my narrative. Um, I'm currently writing um, historical fantasy, <coughs> but I'm not that far into it. So I'm going to talk about... Oh. about um, the trilogy. Um, and one of the things I did in my trilogy that really sort of helped with the characterization is I've got like five different major main characters who are all hanging out together. So they could all come with different perspectives and, um, and kind of butt heads with each other, right? So one person comes from a very middle class background and she's absolutely full of conventional wisdom. Um, but also historical knowledge and all kinds of stuff like that. And then another person is, was literally raised by wolves, um, <laughs> by an actual wolf. And, and uh, her uh, grammar is horrendous, and, um, and she comes from this outside of society place where she comes up against all this conventional wisdom, and she's like, why? How? Explain this to me. And as the as the other woman is trying to explain all this conventional wisdom, like, the, this girl's like, that doesn't make any sense. And she's like, okay, okay, no, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, how can I make this make sense, right? Um, so so we, we can, I can have characters kind of come from, from all different perspectives on their world, um, and some think it's just normal and it's fine, and others uh, don't, and then when they, when they clash, you get characterization of everybody. Right, because you you learn from their perspectives on each other um, what they believe about themselves. Um, so that that's kind of how I did it. Uh, yeah, I was absolutely struck in Silent Hall when you have two women, one raised outside of society, uh, talking about the conventions around marriage and um, uh, monogamy and dating and, uh, in this world, and just the sort of like one is. Po poking holes of logic in the other and just like, oh dear. <laughs> I have a question about, uh, I, I sense an element of magic. You sense an element of magic? Okay, and that's a good and, thing to and, sense. In all, in all of these books. And uh, I want to know from the authors what they feel about magic. Is it real? Is magic a real thing? Is it a, a fictional tool? <laughs> Or is it science unexplained? And, and how, do, how do we go from there? I just would like to hear about their approaches to what magic means. Okay, so uh, we're gonna hear our authors talk uh, about their approaches to magic and what it means. And I guess we'll start with Noah. Cool. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, my, my 
personal beliefs in magic, I mean, there's a bunch of phenomena that I don't understand, but that I nonetheless don't necessarily think of as magic. Um, but in my in my books, magic is a kind of universal poetics, um, where the 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 universe responds to a certain kind of poetry, and that's why uh, you know using certain ingredients and using uh, certain gestures and whatever will have this resonance in the world that responds. Um, and so naturally, while some people go out into the world as sorcerers and they just try to figure out, you know, what, what is this thing that responds? And then just like use the one dumb trick over and over and over again because now I know how to do that. Um, there, there's this like other group called the academic wizards who try to turn it into a science who, who are like okay well we've discovered that we you know that if you do just this thing then it will do that well what if we alter it just a little bit and then see if that still works and see if you know how different that is and so they've they've kind of tried to create this whole this whole science around something that is fundamentally poetic Um, in my book, magic is definitely um, not much of a science. It's somewhat of um, uh, an expression, I would say, of um, characters' kind of true selves. So it's something that I use mostly as a way to expand upon um, characterization and characters' motivations. Um, so for example, the main character has the power to create illusions. Um, so for me, that was a way to explore, you know, um, an element of deception in her personality, um, and whether you know an illusion is a lie, or whether it's a creation of you know whether creating spectacle um, is you know an element of deception. Um, so for me, magic was a way of expanding upon my my character's um, inner selves. Magic is a manifestation of a human desire to change, alter, or control their world. And fantasy novels are frequently an expression of different ways that people might do that and different reasons why they would want to do that. Uh, so it might be a relationship with, with uncertain gods that we have to, you know, we're, we're sort of trying to control them and bring them into our realm by saying, oh right, I have this power that I can use. Or it might be the expression coming from inside of you, well maybe I'm in a powerless state, but I can manifest this power and then use it for influence, use it for good. Uh, and one of the fun things that I did with Elijah is, is when he discovers his power, it is that he has an unnatural affinity with death. So he goes sort of out into the world uh, as a person who cares very, very deeply about life, and yet this is his power. So it was interesting to look at human attitudes toward death, toward what it means, toward how we try to put off that moment, that inevitable moment, um, and then work with the character who is struggling with that at every moment. One of the other characters tells him that he, he stands on the border between life and death, and at any moment his decision could make shift that balance. So. Uh, well, I have one more question for you. Um, and it's a very tough one, and it is what drink, this can be any kind of drink, uh, would you pair with the story you're working on right now? Who wants to start? <laughs> um, I'll go classic with mine. Uh, some really nice red wine, but in a very, very fancy goblet. <laughs> Um, I, I don't have a, a drink in mind, I've got a food, um, <laughs> because the, the, my work in progress right now, uh, a very large portion of it is dedicated to my love for porcini mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet tea. All right, um, so I think that's about all the time we have for uh, for now. Uh, before we go, uh, I'd like to hear from each of our authors about how we can keep up with you. Okay. Um, well, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at N underscore S underscore Dolcart. Um, or on Facebook also as NS Dolcart. Um, I do have a website. It, I use it now and then. <laughs> <laughs> 
and sdolkart.wordpress.com. Efficient. Um, yeah, you can reach out to me at lyricelene.com. I am very, very bad at Twitter, but I am on it, um, at lyricelene. Um, I would say my biggest presence is on Instagram, um, also at lyricelene. Um, so, yeah. At EC Ambrose on Twitter. Facebook would be EC Ambrose or Elaine Isaac. And my website is thedarkapostle.com. Well, uh, if you enjoyed tonight's event, uh, please tell your friends about the reading series and please come again. We're going to be back.